My name is Wayne Darwin. I've been a writer and producer of TV programs and documentaries for some 30 years now. My work's taken me around the world and face to face with everyone from kings to presidents and princesses to movie stars. And from stark reality to the mysterious and inexplicable. Today I'm speaking to you from a secret sanctuary most people wouldn't believe could even exist in modern America and which is presided over by a man who in many ways seems to belong to another place and time. This is the secluded retreat of the Order of the Temple of Astarte, a magical lodge hidden in the wooded hills of Southern California where some still practice the forbidden rites of Solomon and Merlin. On the evening of January 3rd, 2001, I came here with a professional television news crew at the invitation of Frater Thabian, founder and chief wizard of the OTA, to witness and record a remarkable event. Frater Thabian and his apprentice, Frater Solomon, were about to summon an ancient spirit named Visago, whom they believed would bring us important prophecies for the new millennium. On February 1st, an edited version of this remarkable event was broadcast by the affiliate of a national television network. What is our will this night? The Magister Sabion is preparing his temple for the arrival of a special guest. Why will we succeed? Because we will, we will it. it. The mysterious Visago, an ancient spirit said to bear the gift of prophecy. Let there be light in the south. But before the Sago can return from the land of the dead, the Magister Fabion must perform certain rituals. Yeah. With a little help from Sister Ariadne and Brother Solomon, two of the sorcerer's apprentices. The first ritual is said to summon the four archangels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Ariel, to protect against any evil that might enter herein. Michael. Now it's time to open the gateway to the spirit world and lay out the welcome mat with a so-called magic circle ceremony. And finally, a Latin invocation to whatever power controls Visago. Now the guest of honor is ready to make his appearance in the black mirror. Brother Solomon sits before the mirror as the Magister Fabian calls the spirit of Visago. Come, appear before this circle within that triangle and speak unto us in a clear, intelligible voice in our mother tongue, free from ambiguity and guile. Come. Brother Solomon appears to fall into a trance. War upon an eastern star. Visago has apparently arrived and is speaking through Brother Solomon. A house divided. God versus Mammon. Visago's visions of the future come in esoteric images reminiscent of the prophecies of the legendary Nostradamus. Three and a half years of strife. I, Reporter 13, certainly cannot judge their authenticity, nor try to interpret them. The presiding one shows his genius, but it is not what you think. Whether they're genuine and what they mean, I will leave up to you, the viewer, to decide for yourself. Great Prince Basago, because you have answered our call, we license you to depart. But then something strange and eerie would happen that carries disturbing echoes of one of Visago's prophecies. The slaying of a son of Africa undoes a man. Just a week after I witnessed this prediction with my own ears and eyes, President Laurent Kabila of the Democratic Republic of the Congo was assassinated. Now some say prophecy can only be understood when it actually comes to pass. And maybe they're right. It was my job as an investigative reporter to put these modern-day wizards to the test. They had no idea of the questions I would ask, nor did they have an opportunity 
to rehearse their answers. Well, this is the Rivendell Temple of the Order of the Temple of Astarte. And the Order of the Temple of Astarte, or OTA, was founded in 1970 and has been in operation ever since. And we think we're the oldest continually operating ceremonial magic lodge in the United States. What is it that you do? Well, ceremonial magic is a medieval uh, system of what you might call esoteric psychology or esoteric um, magical practice. Uh, it's somewhat similar to the tantric uh, work that is done by the Tibetans and the, and the Hindu tantrics in the East. And it's, it is magic. And magic, as we define it, is not pulling rabbits out of hats or creating uh, illusions. Magic, in our ancient way of looking at it, is changes of consciousness in accordance with the will. In other words, we use the power of the imagination to bring up the ancient gods and the ancient goddesses and, and make them work for us in harmony with nature and uh, with the universe. So. Do you call yourself what you do? It's, uh, it's difficult to put a name on it, but for the general population, I'll use the term pagan. If someone wants to delve a little bit deeper in, I'll say I'm a practitioner of Solomon's magic, and that puts it in a little different light because it puts it in a whole Judeo-Christian uh, uh, framework a little bit more. What is it we're going to see tonight? Well, tonight we're going to call up an ancient spirit named Visago. He's the third spirit in a book of sorcery that we use called the Goetia of the Lamegaton and Visago is number three. How old is Visago and what's the history? He's one spirit I have not been able to locate the origin of. I've studied Biblical Hebrew and his name just doesn't show up with anything I can piece together in my lexicon. Uh, he's at least a thousand years old. The reason why we're going to do him tonight is because he does prophesy. He, he is charged with telling the future. Also, he is of a good nature. Basago is a very kindly spirit. He's a good spirit for Goetic operators to start off with. He's a great spirit for people who are receiving spirits for the first time to start off with because he's so comfortable, he's so genuine, and he's so caring. Some of these spirits are, are not of a good nature, but Basago is definitely one of the good ones. So we thought that that's what we would do. And we have done him before, and we're, we're uh, quite uh, um, we have, we're on good terms with him, let's put it that way. You have a specialty. You, ch you channel. You, you can be a medium for these spirits with Poke. Is that right? That is correct. I am a medium for uh, the 72 spirits. I haven't done all of them, but I've done several of them. And it's a very powerful, empowering spiritual experience uh, every time I do it. You'll always learn something from an operation and get more connected to that positive energy that that spirit has to offer you. Have you sometimes, or do you sometimes call up so, some not-so-good-natured spirits? I have in the past, and there are some that I will never call again. <laughs> once is enough on some of them. For example? Well, I don't want to mention the names because, you know, if I mention the name of one of these really evil entities, um, immediately uh, there are some unwise and perhaps uh, foolish people who will immediately run out and try to do it. So it's better perhaps that we don't mention the names, but let's just say that they are some of the names that if I did mention, anyone familiar with demonology would immediately recognize them. What experiences have you had with these not-so-nice demons? Well, I remember one time when I was first getting started back 32 years ago, and I really wasn't sure of my abilities to do this sort of thing. And I had a, a priestess at that time who was a very, very bright woman, and she, uh, she was uh, in a doctorate program at one of the biggest universities in the country. And, and uh, she had a very analytical mind. And she really wanted to do this particular demon, and I won't mention the name of the demon, but it was a real demon, and she really was uh, anxious to do this demon. So um, I tried, 
to get the demon to come to visible appearance in the mirror, and I tried, and I conjured, and I conjured, and I conjured, and I kept asking her, do you see anything, or do you have a presence, and no, she didn't, and she would uh, stand in front of the mirror and on the triangle, and she wouldn't get it, and I must have gone through about, oh, six or seven repetitions of the conjuration, and then I began to feel kind of foolish, and I thought, well, you know, this is not going to work, and so I said, oh, well, let's forget about this, and um, <laughs> So we, we went to, uh, we, we shut the, two, I just walked out of the, out of the circle. At that time, time I, I didn't even, uh, I was so disgusted at it and so disappointed with the procedure that I didn't bother to do a closing pentagram or to close the circle or to manage the spirit or anything like that. So we just left. And then three hours later, she grabbed me out of a sound sleep and sunk her fingernails into me, into me and woke me up and, and she, she was staring up at the ceiling and she said, there he is. And I had to drag her back into the circle and we had to exercise that spirit. And, what did and that made a, for, from then on out, that made me a believer. How long have you been doing this? I've been doing this about two years. How long did it take you to learn how to do it? It took me about six months before I was at the point where I could start doing Solomon's magic with a goetic mirror. You studied under Pope? Yes. What is the purpose for calling some other spirits? Give me a couple of examples. Um, for one thing, one of the spirits who unfortunately has a bad reputation in, in medieval terminology turns out to be the patron goddess of our temple, Astarte. And she's supposed to be the demon Astaroth, but actually uh, she is the goddess Astarte, and Solomon was quite enamored of Astarte, as you may remember from the Book of Kings. And so we, we call Astarte to visible appearance because she inspires us and is, as I say, the patron goddess of our temple. So she, you might say, is our magical religion. She and her consort, uh, Prince Baal. We follow the Canaanite uh, tradition. Solomon's magic is very dear to me. According to Irish legend, I'm a descendant of Solomon, so that gives me a nice connection to it. And as far as the angels are concerned, I, my parents said they're inspired to name me Michael, and I was born on Michael's holiday that they didn't know about. So I feel a connection to Michael, who's the archangel of Solomon, and to Solomon himself. That's my magical name, Fred or Solomon. You'll notice interesting things like this will actually happen to pop up all the time when you're in magic. And you'll notice things about yourself, little coincidences, that sort of put you into Solomon's framework. In my case, I feel connected to Solomon and Michael the archangel. And this art is very special to me because I'm so connected to it. And it's a, um, it's a form of worship. Yes, it is. It's my way of worshiping God. How can they help you? They can help you by inspiring you, uh, your creativity. Um, they certainly aren't going to help you win the lottery or, uh, well, they might, but I mean, that's not, that, that's not the purpose, is to win the lottery or, to, or to, uh, to be successful in the stock market. We don't do it for that reason. Um, magic is what you might call a spiritual art form. It's like, uh, like spiritual grand opera. We have uh, poetry, we have music, we have drama, we have, uh, we have beautiful uh, sets and costumes, and all of these combine to inspire us. We use the same sort of inspiration that you would get at a good church service, the same wonderful patriotic feeling you'd feel at a parade. These emotions are what we use to galvanize us spiritually and, and to stimulate our creativity. And, and enrich our lives. Is it a form of worship of God? Worship enters into it, but as, a, as something that you choose to do to get the benefit of it. Uh, the Easterners have a term for it called bhakti yoga. It means the yoga of worship, but yoga is a system. So if we worship a deity, a goddess, or God, or something like that. We're doing it for a purpose, not because we're in, in awe of this, 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 um, uh, or, or that we're groveling at the feet of this, uh, this deity. No, we use, uh, we use worship, and we believe something we choose to believe, not because we have to believe it. We choose, we, we choose to believe it in order to achieve a purpose.
Is it another way of, of, of worship of God, or is God not in, a word you would in, use? In our philosophy, in the Hermetic philosophy, God in his or her highest essence is ineffable. You can't understand or even conceive of God as in the highest form. And in fact, we don't conceive of him as being judgmental. We think that in, the, in his highest essence, he simply is, and, and we can't define any further than that. So you might say that we, we believe in one great supreme power that is ineffable and is in everywhere and flows through us, and the best way to define it is to call it love, because love is what holds everything together, and if it wasn't for love, the whole universe would fly apart. So God is love. This, this is true and for us, and we see God as, as an overall, uh, all-encompassing uh, power that flows through everything. But we also see, in, in a differentiated form, we see his angels as messengers, we see the pagan gods and goddesses as personifications of forces of nature, and so we have a a whole plethora of, of entities, and even down into the elements, where we have the gnomes and the earth, and we have the sylphs in the air, and we have the, the undines in the, in the water, and then we have the salamanders in the fire. So we personify all of the elements and everything. We have, we have, a, we have a little entity of some kind or another, or a big entity for everything. What's your reaction to people that say you shouldn't do this stuff, that standard? Well. Uh, that's a great question to ask. Anyone who says this is a cult, I don't really feel a need to argue with them because anyone who uses the term cult is someone who is expressing themselves subjectively. Anyone who calls someone else a cult is basically a worshiper of hate themselves, so if they want to worship hate as far as I'm concerned, that's okay. What do you say to people that call us evil uh, and you shouldn't do it? Uh, I would say that evil is in the eye of the beholder. And what is evil for one person is interesting and challenging for someone else. But it's been my, my experience after 32 years of doing this that uh, the people who seem to be the most affected by these, uh, uh, these upwellings of evil or these, these uh, invasions of evil spirits or these possessions or what, they seem to be the people that are the most uh, fundamental and the most restricted and the most uh, afraid of anything new or different. Uh, they're the ones that are affected by it. Those of us who have a more philosophical and broader and a, and a more uh, tolerant view of these things, we seem to be able to handle it a little bit better. The more traditional worshippers, you know, uh, whether they be Christian or Muslim or whatever, how do they perceive what you do generally? I think that they probably think that we are eccentrics at best and satanic at worst. And, uh, and then in between there's probably an area where they're largely disinterested. <laughs> uh, but I do think, I do want to say that, that uh, no, we are not satanists and of course, but eccentrics, yes, romantics, certainly, but not satanists because satanism is a counter-religion, at least in my opinion. And I, you know, if I wanted to worship uh, a demon, I'd certainly have my own demon. I wouldn't have somebody else's. <laughs> but actually, we don't want to worship demons. So, uh, no, we're certainly not satanic, and we're not even demonic in that sense, although we do master, we do learn to master these, these demonic forces. What is the magic of Solomon? Solomon is, of course, originally the king of Israel in the book of Kings in the Bible. And he lived around 800 BC and he was the great, uh, the great king who built Solomon's temple. So now from his legend, if you will, uh, arises the Masonic fraternity uh, and also arises the legend of Solomon the great magician. He supposedly uh, mastered the, the demons and the spirits and, uh, and, as the Arabians say, the jinn, and got them to help him build the temple. So that's where his legend as, a, as the master of the sorcerers. He's also built a temple to our patron goddess, Astarte. So that's where we have the, have the connection with, with Astarte. And, and so Solomon becomes 
sort of the um, the Merlin, if you will, of, of Middle Eastern magicians. He's he's the legendary uh, patron of the of ceremonial magic. Now, Solomon was used as a pen name during the Middle Ages for writers who wrote books like uh, the Lamegaton and the Greater Key of Solomon. These these uh, these handbooks of, of magic were attributed to Solomon for two reasons. Number one, he was the great the great magician, the legendary magician, and number two, these people were afraid to put their real names on the books because they'd get burned at the stake. <laughs> but anyway, Solomonic ceremonial magic is basically can be broken down into two divisions. The invocation of the angels, the holy angels, to protect you and inspire you and fill you with the power of God. And then, when you've got that mastered, then you set up the dark mirror and the triangle, and then you go for what some people would refer to as the demons. But you use that angelic power that you've already acquired through the crystal ball in the center of the circle and the, on the altar, and you've got that, the power of those angels to control uh, the, the demons that you evoke. You evoke them out of your deep mind. And so Solomonic magic all the way from back in the Middle Ages can be broken down into those two, those two facets. And those facets should definitely be worked together. This is why, by the way, the Satanists don't do this very well, because Satanists can't very well call down holy angels to protect them and then go, and, and then go use that power to control demons. That doesn't work very well for a Satanist. So this is obviously not Satanic. What was Jesus? The, one of the greatest magicians who ever lived, if not the greatest magician, I think, um, but he's also one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived. And I think that one of the very, very sad things about Christianity is that the philosophy, that Jesus' wonderful philosophy, has, was lost when they made a god out of him. I'll tell you a little story about that. Uh, uh, the great biblical scholar, Lamza, who I was fortunate to hear years ago, uh, pointed out that the whole story of Jonah and the whale very probably came from the fact that in Aramaic, uh, when somebody was in trouble, they said he was in a big fish. And, and <laughs> Jonah was in a big fish, and that's how we got Jonah and the whale. But also, if you wanted an Aramaic to call somebody stupid, you called him a rock. So I, I, envision, I envision Simon Magus, who is, of course, a friend of Jesus's and one of, our, uh, and, and one of the founders of our tradition, saying to Peter, uh, when Peter says, said, Oh, the Lord said, I am the rock upon which you will, my, your church will rise. Or, and Simon would have said to him, Peter, that isn't what he said. He said, Peter, you're as dense as a rock, and of my philosophy you will make a religion. And I think that's a very, uh, 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 it's just a story, but, but it's, it's, it, it brings up a point. The, the philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth is beautiful. It's wonderful. Too bad we've, we've lost it. But if you want to pick it up, go to the Gospel of Thomas, and you can find a lot of it there. Was he in any way divine? Was he son of God? We are all sons of God, and that's what he was trying to, to tell us. In the Gospel of Thomas, doubting Thomas, remember? Thomas goes, and, and, and Jesus tells Thomas something, and then the other disciples come and say, what do he say, what do he say? And Thomas says, if I told you, you'd stone me to death. And he could pretty well figure what Jesus whispered in Thomas's ear. I'm God and so are you. And that, I think, was the message. Because the whole Christian trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This is basic Gnosticism. The Father is across the abyss. Uh, the Holy Ghost is that part of the Father that's within us, that holy spark, and the Son is the messenger who comes to tell us, hey, God's right inside you. Tell private. me the procedure we're going to go through tonight, just what you're going to do, what we're going to see. Um, what you're going to see is what, you do, what you're going to see is the the um, the evocation stage of Solomon's magic. This is the advanced stage after you have after you have gone through the series of angelic invocations, which we're not going to specifically do tonight. They've already been done. We've got the angels already inside us and on our side, but we are going to 
invoke those angels with a pentagram ritual. Mike's going to do that, uh, Fred or Solomon. He's going to invoke the angels in a pentagram ritual. Then I'm going to open up uh, the psychic centers because we are, as far as I know, we are the only lodge in the West that has a full operating system of chakras. We have all the planets and the spheres of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life right in one straight line. So we operate that way. So we're going to have a ritual after Mike does his pentagram ritual and establishes these four angels that we're talking about and gets their, them to protect us and cast a circle. Then I'm going to open up the particular sphere that we're working in, the lunar sphere. Then from there we're going to go on up to the sphere of Jupiter. And then we're going to circumambulate around the circle, the magic circle, clockwise, sunwise. And then we're going to get on that mirror and Mike is going to going to be staring into the mirror and I'm going to sit behind him as the magus and I'm going to conjure and he will go into a trance. We'll both be in a trance actually. What happens to you? Before I'll ever do an operation I usually know what spirit I'm going to do and my mindset will already begin to be geared towards that spirit and I'll already be interacting with the energies of that spirit and then by the time I do the operation the spiritual energies from that spirit will actually come inside of me to the point that I'll be able to look in that mirror and my reflection will actually morph into the spirit that I'm having a conversation with. His reflection blanks out and as I'm conjuring then what comes back in is going to be the spirit. What does it feel like? Are you aware of what's happening or are you in a total trance? Can you remember what's happened? I am aware of what ha is happening, but there is somewhat of a transformation that does occur. So what's inside of me isn't really what's me speaking. It's these ideas that are pouring through me from a foreign energy. And these foreign energies will begin to express themselves in their own unique ways that I'll eventually realize are not my own thoughts. He also specializes in his prophecy. So we'll be getting an oracle from Visago tonight, very likely. So we could get some very interesting prophecies. Indeed. It'd be interesting to hear what he has to say. When we videotaped the actual summoning of the spirit in the temple, there were no rehearsals and no retakes. So what you're about to see is real, shown exactly as it happened. And in my professional opinion, it's one of the most remarkable documentations of a supernatural event ever recorded. The name of Raphael, Lord of the air, master of the twice-forged sword, let there be light in the east. The name of Gabriel, Lady of the Waters, mistress of the Holy Grail, let there be light in the west. The name of Mikael, Lord of the Fire, Master of the Sacred Lance, let there be light in the south. In the name of Oriel, Lady of the Earth, Mistress of the Brazen Shield, let there be light in the north and upon the shrine of Our Lady of Starte. As above, so below. What is the creed? To know, to dare, to will, and to keep silence. What is the way? Know thyself. What is the secret of the way? In your temple you are one with the gods. Ata, Gibor, Leolam, Adonai. The temple is open. Gong thrice me.
Sister Ariadne, would you give us a short invocation to the goddess, please? Fair Astarte, we ask that you be with us tonight and guide us, watch over us, and give us your blessing. So mote it be. So mote it be. What is our will this night? To summon, to summon the, the spirit, spirit of the Sago. Will we succeed? We will. Why will we succeed? Because we, we will, it. will it. Ata Malkuth Vegabura Vegadula. Leolam Amashao Adonai Oh hey Before us, Raphael, behind us, Gabriel, at our right hand, Michael, at our left hand, Around us flame the pentagrams, above us shines the sixth-rayed star. Ata, Malkuth, Vegabura, Vegadula, Leolam, Aum. is hereby hermetically opened and unsealed. I declare that within the gate, within the sphere of Yasod, the sphere of Hesed, 
is likewise opened and unsealed. Om. Oh. Let the mystic circumambulation commence. Four turns, Deosil, in the sphere of his said of your sword. the Bornless One, thee that didst create the earth and the heavens, thee that didst create the darkness and the light. Thou art Osiris, Anophorus, Osiris the Beautiful, whom no man has seen in any time. Thou hast distinguished between the just and the unjust. Thou hast created the seed and the fruit. Thou hast made us to love one another and to hate one another. Thou hast created the moist and the dry and all created life. Thee I invoke, terrible and invisible God that dwelleth in the void place of the Spirit. Hear thou me, and make all spirits come unto me. All the spirits of the firmament and of the aether Upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land and in the water, and whirling air and rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God may be obedient unto me. Decam Domino Susceptor Meus et tu et refugium meum Deus meus separabo ensum sitia el. God, and I command thee, my Baralamensis, Malikiensis, Parmantia, Palerosades, and the mighty princes, Geneo and Laocone, ministers of the seed of Tartarus, 
and chief princes of the throne of Apology are in the ninth region. I command thee by him who spake it, and it was done, by the holy and glorious names, Elohim Zebeoth, Shaddai El Kai Adonai Haaretz. Send help on Gambriel. Mikael, Anael, Raphael, Kamael, Zadkiel. Come, appear before this circle within that triangle in fair and human form without or order from it and without delay. Come from whatever part of the world thou art and answer our questions. Come presently, come visibly, come affably, and manifest that which we desire being called by the true and living God, Heliorum. We call thee by the particular God who rules over thee, the mighty hill, the mother usher out of the sea. We call thee in the name of the Tetragrammaton, Oma are overturned, the air is sundered, the sea turns back, the fire is generated, the earth moves, and all the host of things celestial, of things terrestrial, of things infernal, do tremble and are confounded together. Come, appear before this circle within that triangle and speak unto us in a clear, intelligible voice in our mother tongue, free from ambiguity and guile. Come, and the name of God. King of the Southern Quadrant, come in the name of Sitael, come in the name of the Archangel, Mikael. We call thee in the name of Shaddai El-Kai, come, why dost thou tarry? Adonai, Shaddai, King of Kings, commands thee. I call thee, Spirit Visago, strengthened by Almighty God, and I command thee by Barlamens, Isbaldikian, Isbaumontia, Apollos, Sades, and the mighty prince of Genea, and Leocrides, ministers of the seat of Tartarus, and chief princes of the throne of Apology, I in the ninth region. Come, in the name of Tetragrammaton. Wa ma sha o. I am here. We welcome you, Spirit of Sargo. We give you sweet incense and good entertainment. We welcome you to the temple, and we ask you to be ever with us in spirit. Would you? Would you give an oracle for the new millennium? Can you tell us what way lies in store for us in this next few years? As you wish. War upon an eastern star. The king of oils joins the union. 36 items of note, a house divided, God versus mammon. Mammon claims to be God and God is called mammon. Fiery scandals are covered by a deluge. Three and a half years of strife. A presiding one shows his genius, but it is not what you think. The slaying of a son of Africa undoes a man. The son of the South, in truth, is the son of the North. Vidar sits in silence, 
Satan fights with violence. What is hanging by a thread is saved when the snake is shed. Thus ends my oracle. We thank you, Spirit Visargo, Great Prince. We thank you, and we will heed your words well, and we will ponder them, and we will perhaps return and and call you again if we need clarification. Great Prince Pisaco, we ask you to give your blessing upon us here and, and all who hear these words, but even though they are dire portents, if we are in tune, if we are in tune with the current of the new age of Aquarius, Leo, the new age of the Grail, we ask you to lead those of us through this maze. Will you help us through yes. this coming maze? Yes a period of growth, and then the era of peace. Growth cometh not without pain. Would you impart more to us? Keep your hearts peaceful. Keep your focus dedicated to the one true divine source from which we all stem. Give it the glory it deserves, worshiping it in your manner, gaining your peace with it, and understanding that in truth, God is love, and love is universal. Love is not partial but desires the happiness and joy of all. Love is the key. It is the greatest key. It opens the gateways of understanding, of connecting to each other and the divine source from which we all spring, the great parent of us all. Thank you. We can ask for no better encouragement, we can ask for no better consolation. Thank you. Great Prince Pisago, because you have answered our call and have given us profound oracle and teachings and encouragement, we license you to depart and we charge you to return when duly called by the rites of sacred magic. Return to your realm and may the peace of God be between we and thee. Hail and farewell. I'd never witnessed anything like this before and had more questions for Frater Fabian and Frater Solomon. How do you feel after that? Invigorated. And in fact, that's the measure of a good magical operation. If you feel better after you've done it, then you know you've done it right. 
but if you feel drained and worn out and miserable, then, then something, something hasn't gone right. Those uh, prophecies, what are we going to do about those? Well, Evils what we're going to do about them, because uh, that prophecy is so uh, esoteric and, uh, and is, is guarded, and yet very profound, we're going to give it, uh, both uh, Solomon and I are going to give it uh, a very careful attention. And we're going to come up with an interpretation for you. But uh, we're, we're going to have, to have to put our minds to it and put our spirits to it to uh, figure out exactly what we think it means. Mike, how do you feel after that? I always feel good after an operation, particularly this one. Visago, of all the spirits that I interact with, uh, is one of the most peaceful ones. The prophecies, very esoteric. I think they're esoteric. I think some of them are meant to not be understood until after they occur. However, I do think there were certain things which were somewhat clear. Uh, the reference to an eastern star probably symbolizes a nation that will be involved in a war which can be ascertained by its flag. Uh, King of Oil would probably represent uh, one of the Arab countries since they have uh, monarchical systems and are big in oil. And a son of Africa seems to be an obvious reference to a black person who will be killed and gain a great deal of media attention after their demise and the person responsible for their death will obviously suffer some repercussions. Just 13 days after Visago's prophecies were taped, one of them actually came true. President Laurent Kabila of the Congo was assassinated. And now we can only wonder when Visago's other predictions may also come to pass. I'm Frater Thabian, Pope Runyon, and I'm sitting here with Frater Solomon, Brother Michael, and it's a little more than two years after the Visago Millennium Prophecy was delivered on January 3rd, 2001. And we are going to informally discuss some of the confirmations of this remarkable magical document. And we're going to explore some of the prophecies that Brother Michael has received since then, which are even more remarkable. Receiving the prophecy was definitely powerful in and of itself. But the amazing thing is, as you notice these things begin to unfold, they become even more powerful. And what I noticed is a sense of clarity continued after I received the Fasago prophecy where I was able to receive even clearer insights into the future than I did in the given prophecy. The Infantata had begun sometime earlier, several months earlier and, uh, than the prophecy in September. However, it looked like when we delivered the prophecy that the peace process in the Middle East was on track. We thought it was gonna, gonna work and the Israelis hadn't had their election, and the man who was elected wasn't expected actually to, uh, uh, to be elected. So uh, everyone was optimistic about the peace process. Then, following the prophecy, um, of course, we had this terrible 9-11 event, and, and that, I think, is shown in the prophecy in several ways. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned in our our commentary that we published, you and I wrote it, remember, right after 9-11. We wrote the commentary on the, on the prophecy, and the video was released, actually it was copyrighted right on September 11th. That's when the Copyright Office put the stamp on our, on our copyright on the video. What we found out was that Saddam had been, according to your, your research, Saddam had been uh, training this Jerusalem army 
And you saw this in Time or Newsweek or, or one of the national magazines and picked it up. And then we come to, to find out after the war in Iraq that yes, this was confirmed. The, the GIs picked up dozens of these suicide vests, these suicide bomber vests that these people were, were using. But now since GIs have found so many suicide vests coming outside of Iraq with plain evidence, it's now very clear that there's a much stronger connection between Iraq terrorist groups in Syria and the struggle that is occurring in Israel currently. And I remember that you mentioned that in our original booklet. Now thinking just simply upon war upon an eastern star, something is readily apparent. The Israeli flag has a huge star on it. And Middle East, obviously, we're talking about right smack in the center of the Middle East. War upon an eastern star clearly denotes Israel as a target upon which war is being waged. In my Kabbalistic analysis of your final pronouncement, what is hanging by a thread is saved when the snake is shed. If you recall, we didn't quite agree on that one, but uh, here, the key to all of this peace process in the Middle East is the solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians to give the Palestinians their own sovereign state. And it appears that we had to solve this problem of the Jerusalem army first before that could be done. But now that that seems to have been taken care of, we notice that our president and the secretary of state are back to strongly pushing for a solution to the Palestinian problem. And this is what I, I predicted, basically, that, that uh, this would be the only way that we would eventually uh, stop this, this terrorism. And some other fascinating things that showed up were other aspects of the prophecy that we should touch on as well. Beyond the 36 items of note, which I haven't seen a clear fulfillment of at this time, one thing that is definitely much more of note than people realize is mammon being confused with God. Now, Mammon doesn't just represent capitalism. It represents both the British and the American establishment. This is the tradition of who Mammon is. And right now, there's great confusion in the Anglo-American world about how to worship God and what the correct way of dealing with this is. Moving on that and allowing you to ponder with that, there are some other things that are also of interest within the prophecy. One of the major things is the slaying of the son of Africa, which undoes man. The question is, who does this man undo? We knew 13 days later that Kabila was assassinated right in the heart of Africa. But how did this serve to do anyone's undoing? Very good question, Brother Michael. Now, I did some research on this particular issue and discovered that before Laurent Kabila's assassination, there was a major thrust from our government uh, toward uh, nation building and, uh, and major aid in Central Africa. And apparently, after Laurent Kabila's assassination, that whole program just seemed to disappear. So it appears uh, behind the scenes that somebody uh, was in fact undone by this assassination and it probably won't be for another several years before we find out who it was that was undone but it certainly appears that someone was. Well, it's also interesting to note that a year previous to the Visago prophecy in our journal the seventh ray we presented three new tarot cards that we developed for our 11 sphere tree of life system. And one of them has an eerie presage of the 9 11 event and those events predicted by the Visago Millennium Prophecy. This tarot card goes between the sphere of Gabura, Mars, and Da'ath, the gateway into the new age and the new dimension. This card depicts the earlier 
warlike visage of the goddess Astarte, who was known in more ancient times by the name of Anath. She also has a very, very strong relation to Kali, Durga, and the wrathful Dakinis of the Tibetan tradition. But you will notice that we see here the burning fortress, the ruined temple, and the four demons of the elements that she is trampling underfoot. So out of conquest will eventually come victory. Visago continued from that point to give me further revelations and insights. I didn't push to publish these, but now it looks like that's going to have to happen. The following year, on January 19th, we went in and received a new operation, which made it clear that I had to give out what I had received. This was the message that I acted as operator for and which Frater Olin received through Visago. Allow your mind to place itself in front of that mirror as you experience our experience. I am here. Greetings. Do you have an oracle? The one who treats time as though it were space shall find his undoing. All will have been lost. All lost shall be returned. This is the mystery of time and space and things. Can you give us more information on the Visago prophecy? I have said but ask one thing or another as you would. How can we as a temple and church attract and help others? Patience. There is great upheaval everywhere. Conflicting forces. Soon many will come thirsting for what you know. Any further words of wisdom about you and your nature? and us showing proper respect. Simple loyalty. Is there anything further before we bid thee adieu? Not at this time. Depart, hail and farewell. My interpretation of Visago's second oracle, small and short as it was, it was very important. I think what he was trying to say was that right now, at this present time, there is seething hatred all over the world. We have a tremendous upsurge of religious fundamentalism, both in the East and in the West. We have crusade against jihad. And this isn't just between nations. This is also occurring within nations. And therefore, now is not the time to try to raise the consciousness of these conflicting peoples and these conflicting beliefs. They have to blow this off. They have to get it out of their system. And then, following this age of viciousness and intolerance, there will be a new enlightenment. That's my interpretation of what he means. In addition to this prophecy, I did continue to receive further insights from the saga, which will eventually be made available. These insights really opened me up and will allow you to see what is going to happen not only within the coming months and years, but centuries and millennia, long after these mortal bodies have passed. When you read these, you will be amazed 
but at the same time, there'll be a shaky awareness that the things that I'm allowing the Sago to say through me are going to come to pass. There are fascinating things in the future which have not been clearly foreseen. Eventually, after a coalition of democracies overcomes the planet, eventually, a world dictatorship will rise. The Prince of Pride and the King of Conquest. Anyone who dares say this individual is the Antichrist, he will readily have executed. It will be considered a capital offense. Things that we don't now consider capital offenses will become capital offenses. Life will become cheap. Once again, these are ominous portents. And once again, as with the original Visago operation, we don't want to leave on a note of hopelessness, on a note of despair. So let us realize that after every day there must come a night, and after every life there must come death and rebirth. Fortunately, the future, as different as it is from the present time, has many positive things and exciting things to offer as well. An obelisk shall reach the height of the moon. Buildings shall be so vast that cities and counties shall be contained within them. Science is going to offer so many new and exciting insights that there really is much to look forward to. So we will leave you meditating upon the eternal cycle of transformation that awaits us in every day of the future to come. My name is Greg Jednak. You have just seen The Dark Mirror of Magic, which was a remarkable record of an actual magical operation, shown exactly as it happened. If you enjoyed this documentary of a real magical event, then you won't want to miss the instructional video.